Hello, I'm Stephen Foskett, and we are here in San Francisco, California for Cloud Field Day. We're at the offices of Scality, and we've invited in a group of independent writers, speakers, podcasters, and so on to learn about their technology, to interact during the presentation, and to ask questions that represent the audience outside. If you'd like to learn more about Tech Field Day, go to techfieldday.com. You can learn how to become a delegate like the folks around the table or a presenter like Scality. If you'd like to see more videos like this, just go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hello, I'm Giorgio Weni, CTO of Scality. Uh, we're going to talk about the wing and uh, how we can use it for storage of digital businesses. Um, so what we do, to make it very simple, is we take uh, standard servers, so 886 Intel servers full of drives. So the drives can go from four to 10 terabyte and uh, take them and make them one large pool of storage. Then you can consume it as a file object or with OpenStack application. So we're going to zoom on the what we do. Uh, before we zoom on that, I just want to tell a few words about why we even have uh, the ring itself. Um, so in 2008, so the company was started in 2010, but in 2008, um, we had a previous company that was protecting email infrastructure for big telcos, uh, cable companies, service providers, so people like Comcast in the US, or in Europe. And they all complained about uh, Gmail and Facebook uh, giving storage away for free. So they were using expensive SAN systems or NAS systems uh, to store emails, uh, which basically means PowerPoint jokes and pictures of cats in this big financial grade system, uh, where they uh, saw Gmail offering one gig for a mailbox, for example, uh, using off-the-shelf standard servers uh, things that are very different. And so they don't have the engineers to build this kind of solution, these service providers. So we decided to, hey, DNA and I, we know the um, distributed system, uh, we know how to build this thing, so let's build our own uh, storage so that these companies can compete with the Gmail, Facebook, and Yahoo of the world. So we designed it with uh, uh, all the requirements they gave, so it's built for scale, so built for petabyte, going to exabyte of storage. Uh, there's no single point of failure, there's no need for a database to locate your data. Um, it's built for hardware failure, so hardware is everything. We talk about drive, but it's also network, it's also server, this motherboard, so we have to make sure the software can handle all these issues. Um, it's a lot of parallel access, big workloads, mixed, so it could be a photo which is like in the megabyte, could be a video that's in the gigabyte, or an email that's in the kilobyte. So we designed a solution that can work with all these uh, different sizes on the same platform. Uh, we can do both replication, which is multiple copies of the data, and erasure coding, which is calculating parities. We talk about the point cons later on. Uh, and we decided to go software defined, and, and we push software defined storage uh, very far because we are just standard Linux packages. So we don't even give our own ISO image for a customer to deploy on these machines. We support uh, Red Hat, Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, standard distribution, and we just packages that you install on these machines. So um, this is the, uh, the first layer that we developed, the wing, so our software defense storage. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. I will talk about what peer-to-peer -peer means in, in that context later on. Uh, the Hardware is a standard servers, so you can buy them from Dell, from HP, from Supermicro. It doesn't matter to us because we're purely software based. Uh, you install our packages on that and it becomes one large pool of storage. So if the object storage is the engine, but the way you consume it can be file. And so we natively support file application. via are standard file protocols, so SIFs, NFS, uh, Fuse for Linux, an object-based application, and that can be S3, our own OpenStack, or our own API, uh, CDMI, or even OpenStack Swift. Out in the field, what do most of your customers use? Predominantly file or object? It's kind of a 50-50. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have plans of supporting anything in the future, like HDFS or? So not as native HDFS, we're, we're looking at uh, um, using our S3 interface to be a, a backend store for um, when you want to store your long-term data, Hadoop Hadoop into our system, <coughs> more than being the Hadoop uh, repository. Just Any real quick, in the, were you going to say something? Yeah, well, go ahead. In the future, do you, or do you see it trending in one direction or the other between file and object? Like, is object getting more popular or less popular, or? Yeah, so file will never disappear. We, we see no, a lot of demand that. for file. Yeah. And we think and more and more people are, can use object natively today, especially because all the apps, ecosystems, support mm -hmm. PS3 interface. So over time, I think it will be more object. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to be phased out. It's going to take a long time. Oh, yeah. 
Any plans to partner with anybody to sell as an appliance instead of bring your own hardware? So people like HP, for example, they can pre-install a factory already okay. today and deploy a solution that's already configured. Okay, so you can order that direct yeah, from HP? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, talking about uh, when we started and where we are today, so our first deployment was in 2010. Uh, we actually went uh, on a very, very complex deployment. It was two sites, uh, erasure coding, um, and uh, having to do replication on two sites at the same time for a very critical email system in Belgium. It was in 2010, and you would consume us natively as an object store. There, there wasn't a file system or a standard object API. So we had to do application integration to use the system. Then we added more standard interfaces uh, around 2011-2012. So the S3 connector, which is our connector that talks the S3 protocol, so application connects to it, and that connector connects to the uh, security ring. Uh, so it's one of the earliest implementation of S3. Uh, that is not Amazon, and we did that in 2011. Then we added the Russia coding, uh, which simply means that uh, you can protect the data in the same way by adding 30% overhead, where um, replication will be three or four copies to achieve the same data protection. Then we added a file system. So in 2013, we decided to do our own distributed file system because none of the gateways uh, were giving us uh, the performance that customer wanted. Uh, so a lot of object storage solution, when you want file, you go to a partner that is going to deploy a gateway. That gateway is uh, most likely not scale out, so just one single machine or server or appliance. And the gateway talks S3 to the, uh, to the backend. The issues you have is if you have a backend with uh, 10,000 drives, 100 servers, that's very fast, and you go through that gateway, uh, you're not going to get the performance from what's below. So that's why we decided to do our own distributed file system. And uh, it's kind of where the uh, growth started to go to accelerate. Because now, regular application can use, could use our storage. They don't have to be object applications. Um, now we're moving. We added OpenStack and a lot of uh, um, automation to our software. Uh, Software-defined storage also means that uh, there's API and you can automatically deploy uh, without having to do any manual task. So we invested a lot in 2014. And now um, we have um, a new version of our S3 interface that we talk about in another slide deck where we actually can uh, connect to the IAM uh, model for user authentication from Amazon. Uh, and that gives us a lot of flexibility and multi-tenancy. Real quick, um, on the object side, S3 versus CDMI. Do you, does anybody use CDMI? Is there even a question? <laughs> 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 no, it's uh, S3. It's, uh, it's yeah. Yeah, so no, it's just why. I see CDMI on there. Yeah. And uh, so the thing to know about CDMI is that if you just look at it from far away, it's just HTTP. Get, put, delete. Then you can do more if you want. But it's just plain HTTP. So actually, we have customers using it. They just use it as plain HTTP. Right. So you ingest via NFS, serve via HTTP to a CDN, for example. Uh, but as using CDMI, uh, the entire spec and all the different things inside, no. I so don't think so. That's okay. why we went S3 again. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the market we go after, uh, public cloud and the enterprise. So uh, we have uh, 116 customers, uh, good growth. In terms of uh, where the customers are, it's 50% in North America. 45% uh, in Europe and 50% in Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, in terms of business, it's a uh, public cloud. So it could be consumer public cloud or enterprise public cloud. I will talk about that. And enterprise and government are using our system. So in terms of public cloud, consumer services, uh, so big telcos like Comcast, uh, SoftBank in Japan, Orange, Telstra. This is uh, where we started. As well as uh, Dailymotion. Uh, Dailymotion, I don't know if you aware of it, but it's kind of a YouTube com competitor in, uh, in Europe, mm. uh, and they use us to store uh, all the videos. Uh, then uh, you have people who sell infrastructure as a service, so that's more for the uh, enterprise. So hosting company like Workspace or OVH use our software uh, to provide storage to their own enterprise customers. And, and then you have a specific um, each uh, vertical uh, has its own provider. So NetDocs is, uh, is for lawyers who want to store documents securely. So it's a public cloud for a special group of people. Uh, and uh, IoT uh, is uh, something that's starting to grow for us as well, uh, where we basically are an interface for people to dump all their logs, data uh, online. 
Then you get the uh, instance of data. Then you got the enterprise. So they use us as a, a private uh, cloud. So banks, Société Générale is a bank in Europe. Uh, they use us for video distribution. So Deluxe, um, Eurosport, RTL, these are all uh, RTL and Eurosport TV stations. So they need to store data to serve online via HTTP. Uh, then you have backup. So Netexis is an insurance in the bank. Uh, they use us to for the, for the backup. And uh, government and surveillance, it's um, Metropolis in the UK, uh, US intelligence, UK intelligence, they, they all store a lot of ma massive amount of content uh, and they uh, deploy your software for that. So it gives you an idea in terms of uh, use cases. Uh, so we work with HP, Dell, Cisco. Uh, we're starting to work with AWS as well. So the fact that we support the uh, IAM model, so it's a, it's a very, very fine-grained multi-tenancy model on Amazon where you have a, an account, can, can have groups, can have users, that can be linked to an active directory uh, so that uh, you speak the same language that all the other software in your data center. So we've been starting to talk with them because that's very interesting to them. Uh, a lot of uh, ISVs, so companies who provide a software that can talk via S3 protocol, they like to work with people like us for customers who want a private deployment as opposed to public. Uh, so we invest, still continue to invest in sales and uh, engineering, and we have around 70 uh, developers and split between San Francisco and Paris. So Giorgio, the, the AWS uh, partner network, does that mean that scale is available on like uh, AWS Marketplace? Or? So n not yet, but we're actually working on it. How tight are you working with AWS, the storage integration teams? I talked to them a while back and I don't... We don't talk with a storage team. Okay. No, it's more of a partner. Okay. Yeah. How closely are you tracking the S3 API set? How are you 100%? I don't think anybody's 100%. No. So we're not trying to go 100%. We, we're trying to be compatible with all, most of the applications that people would use. Okay. So like if there's a, a feature that's been added and then replaced because, you know, Amazon goes very quickly, yeah. we will not invest in the old feature, for okay. example. Right? So we try to keep uh, ahead and be compatible with the applications. Okay. Right? So we, we're more looking for uh, compatibility in terms of behavior of the system and in terms of integration with all the user management. Yeah. It's more important for the enterprise. Uh, so let's uh, go into the technology. Uh, Stefan told me that uh, I could go as deep as I wanted, so <laughs> i try to make it. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, that's very deep. Yannick is smiling. Uh, I'm not going to stay too long on this slide, but what's very important is uh, we are a peer-to-peer -peer system, so all of these dots Think of them as servers into the distributed system. And we don't want to have to maintain a, a map of uh, this server has that object, for example, because this would be too hard to, to maintain. So what we do instead is uh, each server has a, a little piece of that key space, what we call a key space. So the key space is 20 bytes, but uh, for the example, I make it from 0 to 100. So this would be 0, 25, 50, 75. And uh, when you want to store data, you can ask any other node, uh, where should I go for that object? So the object has a key. So where should I go for the object 10? So if I were to ask this machine, it has existing connections to a number of nodes into the distributed system. And so it can quickly point me in the right direction. So if I'm looking for 10, it knows the key of that server. So this one may be the uh, server 15. So that's where the data should go in terms of placement on the circle, uh, and I have an answer right away. Now if I were looking for data that's here, so let's say that uh, it's a 60 in terms of a key, and I ask this machine, it's gonna use that connection to go to 50. 50 will have its own mapping, so take this and flip it the other, the other way, and now 50 will tell me an answer very quickly because it has a connection. So this algorithm uh, is called CORD, and it guarantees that we can locate any object in half log to the number of servers. Uh, in terms of uh, capacity, if I have uh, 100 petabytes of storage, I can locate any object in less than three lookups. So that's very, very important. So we don't have to maintain a table and you still locate data very quickly. So on a typical 10 gigabit network that we use, uh, that has a sub millisecond latency, these lookups doesn't take a lot of time, right? It's like a few milliseconds as compared to the drives themselves who, who had uh, typically had 50 milliseconds of latency. So this way we don't need to store any data that's not needed and it's completely dynamic. So if the topology changes, the algorithm automatically works. You don't have nothing to configure. 
so this, all this extension we did to Accord, it's a patent, it's our first patent that's available online. Uh, and so we made a lot of changes. The most important one is uh, transactions. So, you know, we do a file system on top of our object storage. So there's a lot of things where uh, all the operations have to, have to happen in a transaction, right? Otherwise, you will lose data or not be consistent. So we implemented a lot of transaction mechanism inside the object store. Uh, so checking a version, locking, reserving an update, things like that. And that's how we can provide a file system on top. And we've been working on self-healing, uh, which is about detecting failures and we're building as fast as possible. And I have a presentation afterwards about durability where I talk about these two aspects. So uh, you have cluster size or ring size limits? In what? terms of the... Uh, Number of servers. Yeah, so in terms of the algorithm, no. In terms of the practical that you can do on a, on a, on a network, I say that uh, we save until 10,000 servers. How many? 10,000. 10,000. Oh. What's your largest cost? Largest install? 10,000 nodes, actually. 10,000? Okay. Uh, no, no, our larger customer would be more than 1,000. Okay. What's your preferred interconnect between the servers? Uh, two 10 gigi. Okay. Yeah. So we have a few people deployed in InfiniBand. That was my next question. It's a little bit over here. Okay. Yeah. So you don't think it's needed to go to bottom no. with 40 gig? No, because the, the, this is a protocol that, um, if you look at this, uh, the uh, addressing is, is uh, distributed. When you know where to go, it's a one-to-one -one communication. I see. So you're not So you're not wasting that. anything. Right? I see. The wasting bandwidth. Okay. Um, so we can do both replication and erasure coding. Um, again, we didn't want to have a database to have any central location engine. So when we replicate data, so in that example, object 11, uh, we're actually going to compute the keys of the replicas. So meaning that we don't have to look up in a table somewhere where are the, what are the keys for these replicas. We're just going to calculate them. We calculate them by projecting on the circle. So 11 becomes 91, 91 becomes 171. Uh, and this way, if I've lost 11 as a client to the system, I can just project, which is an in-memory calculation. There's nothing to look up. Get that key and do the code lookup, where is 91, and get the replica. Right? Uh, and so this uh, works from uh, uh, one copy to five copies of, of an object, and also works for our erasure coding which is uh, calculating parities instead of calculating, uh, instead of doing replicas. So an example, if I have a 10 megabyte object, uh, so one, two, three, four, five, so let's say a, a six megabyte object, uh, I'm going to slice it into one meg pieces, the data, which are, we're going to store in clear. And then I compute, uh, in that case, three parities. I'm gonna store in different locations. So if I get the data, I go directly to the data slices. If I want to get, if I lose one of the data slices, I can compute it back from the parities. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's really important is that in that case, I can lose three, any of the three servers or any of three drives, but the overhead is only 30% when so you compare a parity to data. Choice between replication and erasure coding. So, um, typically, if the object is big enough, you're going to erase your code. Okay. And below a certain size, you will do a replication. Oh, okay. A camera was blocking it. I see under yeah. 60K, yes. over 60K. So you make Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just for my comprehension, what, what's a connector? Oh, sorry. The connector is a layer in front of uh, the ring itself uh, that talks to the application. So the connector gives you standard protocol. Yeah. So file, NFS, object is yeah. 3 for example. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> this was the connector there, slide. In failure scenarios, is there a different, so you can lose you know, up to three drives around the ring or five drives. What about in a particular server? Does it matter it, or is the same number? Uh, you can actually five. lose more drive on, on the machine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the way that it's done, there's, there's never a machine that's a copy of a machine or a drive that's a copy of a drive. It's all fully meshed, so you can lose more. Okay. Um, so this is our distributed file system. So it's a set of connectors in front of the object store. And they can do NFS, typically for Linux application, uh, SMB for Windows, or SIFS would be a better term, uh, and also Fuse, which is a, a more native way to do uh, the file system for, for Linux. They all see the same namespace, right? And we have a, a layer of uh, load balancing that we've developed like for NFS, so that if you lose a, a head, like a connector, you can transparently fill over to another one. And we also have a persistent cache 
to speed up lookups and directory operations on, on that system. Then all the data itself, including the folder information, is stored in the ring, in the distributed system. And the connectors run in the uh, host server or in the nodes on the ring? So on only this one, the fuse one has to run on the client. All the other one run on the storage nodes. And some customer, we want to have a dedicated connector layer, but they don't have to. It's an architecture decision. And I heard you say read caching. Do you do any level of write caching there? And if so, how is it protected? No, we don't do write caching. Okay. Only read caching. Um, so let's talk a little bit about management and, uh, and operations. So uh, we have a UI we call the, the supervisor, where you see your ring and the status of the ring itself. Uh, here you have a list of uh, servers. So it's actually nodes. One server has multiple nodes in the distributed system, and we do that for load balancing uh, reasons. Uh, you see the drives attached to uh, that particular server. So the su supervisor manages the key space, so you don't have to deal with the key space itself. There's a lot of intelligence on the key space and the way that we calculate it, because it has to enforce all the uh, projections that we're talking about for the, the replicas. Um, so this is where you go for operations, node management, hardware management, adding servers, removing drives, things like that. Um, and it's also uh, what gives you stats and metrics for the entire platform. We have a, a command line interface uh, that gives you the same uh, information but on the command line. That's easy to script because it's Python based. Um, and we also provide SNMP standard uh, for monitoring and Azure's plugins and, and tools that you can use on the command line as well for everything that's about disk management. And uh, we also have a performance tracing tool you know, on file system when you, when you deploy. It could be that this particular application gives you a better performance because of the way that it does the I.O. or things that you could optimize. So we have a performance tracer tool that we can use to trace uh, file system operations and see uh, if there's anything that uh, is uh, hurting performance. And then, um, you know, in terms of software defined storage, uh, we talk about that a lot. What it means for us is, first of all, we uh, support standard Linux distribution. We don't come with our own uh, OS or image you have to deploy itself. So it means that we have the latest drivers from the distribution. Uh, we're compatible with the uh, hardware compatibility matrix from the uh, uh, Linux distribution. Uh, and the other side of it is uh, automating deployment. So being standard Linux packages makes it easy for us to use tools like Ansible and Salt. Uh, so sometimes customers have their own. It's easy for them to adapt. But we ship with a, a set of tools, uh, a script that they can use to deploy everything automatically. Right. Um, then we integrate with standard monitoring tools as well. So the supervisor is good for the admin, for the engineers. The operation knock people want to do their, use their own tools. And for that, they use uh, Nagios or SNMP, sometimes ELK. And you will see, uh, we use a lot of uh, Docker containers now. Um, and that makes it very easy to demo something on a laptop. So later on, we have a demo of our S3 interface on a laptop. And the same container can be used uh, from the laptop to an Exascale uh, deployment. Just real quick, so how, how do you leverage Docker containers? Uh, so on our new S3 interface that we talk about, everything is packaged as a Docker container. Uh, which makes it very easy to deploy on any Linux. Uh, so the product itself. Yes. Not okay. We're not container storage for Docker. The no, 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 no. Uh, you're, you're using containers yes, to implement right, your exactly. product. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so to uh, sum up, in terms of um, what we support as an interface to our storage, uh, so one of the way we go after a customer is to start with one use case. And then they will add use case after, after that. And that's when they do economic of scales, because they can deploy a distributed system once, and then add more applications, and then mutualize uh, the IOPS and the storage capacity. And so to do that, we want to support as many protocols as possible. So this is object S3 on our, our own native interface uh, for file, NFS, SMB, Fuse, for OpenStack, Swift, Glance, and Cinder. And then we have our own compliance connector, which is an, an OEM with a company called Eternity uh, that you can use for warm and compliance, especially ACC compliance. And so our angle in an account is to start with one use case that may use one of the protocols and then add applications on top. Uh, and uh, that's where you really see the economics of having a distributed shared storage. So, I mean, you mentioned that you don't have any single point of failure and that there's really no metadata directory per yeah. se in one location. So how does that work again? I mean. 
You kind of went over that a little bit quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, because that's a long topic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is that, that's basically the chord algorithm. Yes, yeah. that's basically the chord. Yeah. So um, the, there's two answers to that. So chord allows us to locate an object anywhere in the system. So without a central repository. Without a central repository. So chord takes, takes care of that. Uh, then we use the object as the building blocks for uh, our folders, for example. In that case, we have uh, an engine that uh, is a distributed B plus tree. Uh, but we actually use object as the pages in that engine. So if you look at the folder in the file system, uh, it's actually, the folder listing is a, a bunch of objects that are part of a B plus tree. And we use our transaction engine that I talked about to, be, to do changes to that tree that are atomic and consistent. And yeah. so that's how we can and, provide and folders. And spread across the... And that's protocols because the underlying building blocks is an object, the object is fully distributed.